Hi, everyone. We're going to make a start. Thanks so much for being here. Very pleased to see you. Um, I'm not Barack Chakmak, just for your information. Um, he's actually ill, I'm afraid, so I'm doing the introductions. My name is Hazel Clark, and I'm Research Chair of Fashion here at Parsons. So, um, really pleased to see you all here. I sort of see you. And also very, very pleased to um, welcome an amazing panel. I think it's going to be a very, very interesting evening. Um, I will also say just two practical things. At 7 o'clock-ish, when we finish, we will be having a reception, which will be just left and left in the sort of main lobby area. You're very welcome to join us and to chat more with the speakers. Um, we will allow time for Q&A. The, the, the um, running order is that each of the speakers is just going to say something for about five minutes to give their position. Uh, and then we're going to have questions to the speakers from the moderator. And then we will open to audience question and answer. And we will also be recording the event. Um, so it will be then on the New School site as a YouTube. So you can watch it again or um, hopefully recommend it to your friends. And so just a little bit of background um, in terms of why we're here. and why we're actually addressing this issue this evening. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, the New School and Parsons does have um, a commitment to diversity and also to um, you know, social, cultural, political diversity. But more um, centrally for this evening, we really wanted to focus that attention on the body and um, on the body um, as become as a sort of focus of conversations we're having here in Parsons, but also I think broader conversations elsewhere in the media, et cetera, which I'm, you're very aware of. Certainly fashion design students are being encouraged to break down stereotypes and to take a more inclusive view of design. Although again, as some of you know, that sometimes has its hurdles um, in terms of dress forms, in terms of the sort of language being used in the industry, um, the ter in terms of sort of protocols, imagery in and around the fashion system. So we, while wanting to encourage um, new approaches that em embrace a broader spectrum of body types, um, sort of race, gender, etc., it's not without its um, tensions and issues. But this broader approach is certainly foundational to the theory and the practice of our fashion teaching here, which certainly recognizes the existence of more negative attitudes towards body diversity that re relegates many people, um, women but also men, outside of the fashion system. So this conversation is very timely given the fact that there's a significant um, segment of the US population certainly that's, that's underserved in terms of access to fashionable clothing. But it also, as I said, importantly represents a design issue that many of our students are eager to address by developing um, what we might call more progressive approaches to more inclusive design. So on that, I'd like to just give a, a brief introduction to each of our speakers in the um, order in which they'll speak. So first, Becca McCarran, McCarran sorry, who's here second. She's waved at you. Becca founded Chromat in 2010. She's a, a native of Virginia, and um, she's carved out a niche in bodywear that encompasses activewear, swimwear, and lingerie, um, instantly recognizable from her cage bras, harnesses, structural showpieces that draw on her architectural background, but have always already become a favorite on stage for artists such as Beyonce, Madonna, and Nicki Minaj. Uh, Becca has made, also made headlines for her casting choices that have included working with models from a wide range of sizes, races, and gender identities and abilities, including Lauren Wasser, who, who lost part of her leg due to toxic shock syndrome, who walked in uh, Becca's New York Fashion Week show. Next is uh, Huguet Hubbard, next along the line. Uh, Huguet is currently um, Vice uh, President of Design at Lane Bryant, which will be a a name that's known to you very well. She was previously VP of Design at Doran, Donna Karen Collection, where she spent 10 years. And before that, she was Design Director, Thank you. Design director of um, Pringle in Scotland. 
Um, he got graduated from Central St. Martins in London and studied there under the uh, visionary late um, director of the master's program, Louise Wilson. Next, um, second from right, uh, sorry, next um, to uh, Hugh Gett, sorry, I'm getting my wording wrong already, is Elizabeth Taylor in the pink. Um, Elizabeth is a plus size model and designer, originally from Long Beach, California. She has a degree from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts and has been working in fas the fashion industry for over 10 years. Her current clients include Melissa McCarthy, Macy's and Target uh, and Maidenform and many others, where she primarily works as a fit model and has um, proudly watched the industry change over the years. Elizabeth currently has a clothing line. She, she guest designed with pin-up girl clothing, as well as uh, jewelry made here in the US, and she is a proud eating disorder survivor and a firm believer that fashion heals. The next um, along the line is Hara Marana. And um, Hara, in 1990, published a book called Style is Not a Size. Um, since then, she has been uh, working at Psychology Today, amongst other things, as editor-at-large, formerly editor-in-chief, and she's also written for the New York Times, LA Times, US Today, and magazines including um, the Smithsonian, Glamour, and Family Circle, among others. More recently, of her three books, she's published in 2008, A Nation of Wimps, The High Cost of Invasive Parenting, which looks at the culture of overparenting. And then next on the far right is Lauren Downing-Peters. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Lauren because she is a graduate of the first cohort of our MA Fashion Studies here and now is a PhD candidate at Stockholm University. Um, I'm not only pleased um, because Lauren started her work on what we can arguably call plus size um, when she was a master's student, but she's now working on that subject for her PhD where she's taking both a historical approach and a contemporary approach to um, plus size in parentheses in the United States. And last but absolutely not least, I'm delighted to introduce closest to me our moderator, Bethany Heitman. Um, Bethany is executive editor at Style Watch. She spent over 13 years producing content geared for women and has previously held senior level positions at Cosmopolitan and Seventeen. Um, Bethany has interviewed some of the most powerful female entertainers, including Adele and Taylor Swift. She's written investigative reports on topics like body shaming and workplace harassment, and has worked on countless high-profile fashion and beauty initiatives. Bethany has written four books and has been a regular co-host on Sirius XM, and most recently she helped to um, launch and grow the Outfit.com, Stylewatch's com companion site, that curates and provides style inspiration for fa from fashion and beauty editors, influencers, and readers. So I'm now going to hand over to Bethany, who will introduce our speakers in turn, and then, as I say, she will um, ask some questions and open the floor for Q&A. So thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna speak for a moment before we get to our wonderful speakers. Uh, I am so excited to be a part of this conversation tonight. Um, I joined Style Watch almost two years ago, um, around the same time we got a new editor-in-chief. And um, instantly we made it our mission to rethink the way this magazine approaches women um, of all shapes and sizes, um, of all races, uh, and of all styles and backgrounds. Um, we had noticed, uh, both of us being in the industry for a long time, that when plus size fashion was covered, it was segregated. That there was usually one page, maybe two, somewhere sort of in the middle of the magazine, um, and that was it. Uh, we wanted to change that, um, and so we did. It was sort of that easy. We started incorporating plus size merchandise, plus size models, plus size um, real women, um, and not just plus size, women of, of different body shapes, uh, into every single page of the magazine. Uh, and not calling it out, not patting ourselves on the back of saying, look what we've done, right? We walk around this world every day and there's women of all shapes and sizes and we wanted to represent that in the magazine. Um, so this is one of our features from last year. We used a beautiful model, her name's Candace, um, 
and it's not a story about plus size women or fashion. It's just a great dress story. Um, and you, you know, the following spread had a model who was probably a size four. Um, and the next page after that had a model that was maybe a size 16. Um, and we have you know, all kinds of merch for all types of women. Um, the other thing we really started doing and focusing on was incorporating real women uh, into our shoot. So this is a bathing suit story for your summer, uh, finding the perfect suit for your body. Um, these are all real girls um, and all different kind of shapes and concerns and, and thoughts. Um, my favorite part of working on this story was that Christina Brown, who's in the middle here, was hesitant to do this story. She was hesitant to strip down into a bikini um, in a magazine that she knew went out to millions, and I can't really blame her. Uh, I think it's a terrifying thought, but uh, she said to me that she only did it because she hoped that she wasn't 100% about her body. She doesn't necessarily love it every day, but she hoped that by showing that her body was good enough to be in a magazine, that it would help other women feel the same way. Right? And I thought that was such a powerful and nice thing and a reason to do this sort of stuff. Um, so anyway, it's a conversation that we're having constantly at Style Watch. We don't have the solution, and we know that. Um, we're doing our best. But why I'm so excited to be here is because I think that the only way to get to a better solution is by hearing different voices and hearing different people talk about things that we can all do together, right? Not one person is going to solve this problem. So. I'm going to hand it over to our great speakers, and then we'll ask them some questions later. Um, but I'm going to introduce Becca first to talk about it. Hello. My name is Becca McCarran. I'm the designer, uh, founder of Chromat. And Chromat is architectural swim, lingerie, and athletic wear for um, strong, powerful women. And first of all, thank you so much to Hazel Barak and the Parsons team for having me. It's an honor to be here. And I think it's so cool you guys at Parsons get to hear people from all different industries speak about this issue. Um, for me, diversity is definitely not just about size, and I hope that we touch on more than that today. I see, I feel like when I go to panels, I see all white people talking about diversity. It's a little, you know, one-sided. So I really hope to just get that right out in the open and be like, we're, we're hopefully gonna talk about a lot, and hopefully as the panels progress, as the series progresses, more and more um, voices are added to the conversation. But um, just to show you where it all began, um, this was our first runway show five years ago. Uh, that's baby me. <laughs> but um, from the beginning, who we showed on the runway, sh our runway shows reflected who was inspiring us, who was in the Chromat world. This reflected, I mean, our first show, we basically were calling friends and asking people to model for us. So we had um, trans woman Jordan Fox model for us and just all different types of women of, of all different races and, and gender identities and, and different sizes. So this is from our DNA from the start, and this is what we believe in. This is who we're designing for, and this is why we do what we do. We're so lucky to be in such a rich, dynamic community in, in Brooklyn and in New York, and so our runway shows have always reflected that. And um, this was one of the highlights of our runway show history. Denise Fadeau opening our runway show. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Denise has become such a true friend of ours, and we're all in Denise Fadeau fan club. Um, and so this was a big moment for us. It was the first time we had a curve model, a plus size model, open up our runway show. She was the first model to open the runway show. No one was expecting it. And it definitely sent shockwaves through. Um, the reviews of our show the, the, that season in particular, and it just, for us, represented a big change. And this was, um, we show it made every season. Milk has been so generous to have shows with us. And this was, um, it was interesting for me to, to see the coverage post-show because just as you can see here, there's w women of all different sizes, all different gender identities, um, races, and, and backgrounds, and that's normal to me, and that's, that's who I celebrate, that's who we celebrate in our work. But the coverage was so focused on this plus size model opening the show, and, and I was so frustrated because I was like, wait, we just spent six months designing these clothes, like, let's talk about that too. This is all our hard work, the rest is normal for us. And um, now, five years later, I realized what an asset it is to have 
diversity and inclusivity be one of the things that people recognize about us every season. I'm proud of that history. I'm proud that people see themselves in Chromat. And so here's some of the more recent collections. This was fall 16, so this is in stores now. And um, like Hazel said, we had the model Lauren Wasser, who has a prosthetic leg um, walk in her sh our show, and she's incredible. We had um, trans activist artist Juliana Huxtable walk in the show, and there's Denise again. And you know, it's interesting, and I want to bring this up, but um, you know, we show all our runway models on our Instagram and social media, and. I find that it's something strange, but when we show really skinny, just normally slender people like this model on the far right, that body gets more negative feedback than the plus size models, and I find that kind of an unbalanced thing too. I feel like, you know, when we're celebrating all these curvy women, which is what we should be doing, we should be celebrating also the naturally slender and just have no holds barred to this negative criticism or have no... Um, no place for it. So that's one other thing I wanted to bring up. So this is my final slide. I, this is backstage at the most recent show um, in February. And I, I just love, love, love this picture because it just represented the, the high energy there was backstage where we had models of all different sizes, races, you know, everything, um, abilities, genders, and everyone was so happy to be there and so proud of what they were doing and so excited to see people who look like them, who didn't look like them, and everyone just felt so confident, and that's our ultimate goal with making these clothes is we work also in technology. We actually did a technology lecture here yesterday, and I feel like um, for me, at the end of the day, the goal of Chromat is to make garments that empower women, that make them feel like the strongest, most the best version of themselves. And so going to this runway show in September and going backstage and seeing these amazing women representing these, these garments and seeing them really feel that way in the moment, it was definitely like the ultimate, uh, it was just sort of the ultimate uh, reason that we do what we do in, in fashion design. So thank you so much for being here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. My name is Uget, I work at, I'm VP of Design for Lane Bryant. Um, as Hazel said, I, I started my life in high-end design and I spent 10 years of my life at Donna Karen. Donna created clothes for real women when she started in the 80s and 90s. She, she used to say she dress, well, she still says she dresses and addresses women. It wasn't just about the fashion, it wasn't just about the statement, it was about, it was at a time in the 80s when women were starting to go to work Right when this was what they were about, and she made clothes that, that worked for their lifestyle, that worked for her bodies. Since then, fashion has changed, and, and I think when we have the internet and when we have the amount of information that when we have, and we, when, when we have all these things going on, the, 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 the speed at which things change, the focus on a lot of the high-end fashion leaders has become change. What's new? Right? What's exciting? What's different? What hasn't been out there? I'm not saying that's what everybody does, but that's certainly what, what the focus has become. And so a lot of the, a lot of the, the woman, the word, the customer, has been lost. As fashion has become more demanding, as fashion has become more about pushing, about expressing what's going on in society, about expressing what's new, the, the, the concept of designing clothes for women has been lost. And with that, their bodies have been lost. If you think about the supermodels in the 80s, if you think about Naomi Campbell, and you, and you think, they were Amazons. These women had bodies. These women had attitude. And as the clothes, has become, as the clothes have become the, the expression, the body has almost disappeared, right? So this, the way I've written it down, it, it has created an increasing demand on a decreasing frame. In order for you to wear a beautiful 30-pound Celine double, double goss coat, you need to be that skinny and that tall. It was interesting in the time that I, that I worked at Donna Karen. Donna was not, is, is not the most avant-garde of designers. She still dresses women. She still makes real clothes. But it was interesting even then two things, we'd do collections, and then the models would come in, and these models would all be a size two, size four, tall, skinny, and the clothes wouldn't fit them the same. They wouldn't, they wouldn't look the same. 
And then when you saw the clothes on a size eight, five foot four woman, it was still a struggle. And this is not even the most demanding clothes in the world. So we've somehow, somewhere along the line, lost the sense that clothes for real women and fashion are one. Two years ago, I got a call from Linda Heasley, who is the CEO at Lane Bryant. I was still at Donna Karen, and I, and I, and I got a call, and she was interested in, in, in coming and me working for her. And Linda's vision is about changing perceptions, changing the way women see themselves. And so we talked, and, 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 and I was really seduced by, by what she was trying to say. And so I, I've been working at Lane Bryant for two years. A lot of people ask me, what, what makes, what's different? What's the difference between working at Donna Karen and working at Lane Bryant? People say, you know, it must be technically difficult, you know, right? If you're, decide, if you're used to designing for a size two, it must be really hard to design for a, for, for a size 12. Or they say, you know, is, there, is, the is it difficult to work with cheaper fabrics? De dressing and designing for plus is no more challenging than making flattering clothes for any size women. Knowledge and technique matter in design, in cut, in execution. But what is more groundbreaking, more important, and much more relevant in today's world is being able to shake the blinders that tell us that beauty has one expression. That it's only the model down the classic runways that is beautiful. The truth is, once you start looking at women's bodies, they're all beautiful. Like if you look at that slide, this is the advertising campaign for Cacique. It is unquestionable that these women are beautiful. We don't represent women as beautiful in all their differences. So learning to look at women, learning to look at their bodies, at all sorts of different bodies, at all sorts of different types of women, and understanding that they're beautiful is the real challenge to designing beautiful plus size clothes. There's, we've been doing a lot of work on pants and pant fit. Now there's not a woman in the world who doesn't know what it's like to put on a pair of pants that fit and a pair of pants that doesn't fit. All of us have been in a change room and have been like either like or oh my God. <laughs> right? There's nothing but we've been doing a lot of work at Lane Brand on, on the technology that, that is going to make a pair of pant fits. How, how the waistband expands and retracts without being an elastic. The fabric we use, the fit we use, reducing the curve on the side so that you're always looking slim but com compensating on the inner thigh so that it's not tight, all this stuff. There's nothing more empowering as a designer than watching a woman put on a pair of pants and walk out of the changing room, standing different, strutting, looking at herself and going, hey, it doesn't matter what size she is. That's the power of design. That's the magic of design. <laughs> we at Lane Bryant think this is something of a revolution. We think from, from the design collaborations we've been doing with, with people like Isabel Toledo and Prabal Goren and, and, and Christian Siriano to magazines like Glamour and, and Refinery and, and all these people who are making, who are making strides and, and, and making changes to Ashley Graham on the cover of Sports Illustrated. We think a forum like this, we think this is a revolution and I believe it's up to you, the next generation, to really change this, to make fashion something more and more relevant than what it is today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, how do I go forward on the PowerPoint? Just tell me. I can figure it out. Is it just the arrow? Yeah. It's just the arrow. Yeah. Okay, well, then I'm going to. I, okay, I got it then. This baby's first PowerPoint, you know what I mean? So um, that is my real name. It's Elizabeth Taylor. Um, my parents are slightly insane. Um, so I'm from Southern California, and I grew up um, not having diet culture really around me. I know a lot of young women say that, like, they're mothers or they felt an influence through schooling or friends. I didn't really have that, but I certainly had our media 
Um, I often think of billboards. Um, I think of passing on the freeway with my dad. You know, just seeing women's bodies and connecting at a very young age that it was who I needed to be. Um, I very clearly remember trying on bongo jeans at the wet seal dressing room of the Lakewood Mall and not fitting into the size uh, 13, which was the end, the largest size, and how deeply that affected me at probably 10 or 11 years old. And um, that kind of began, I would say, now uh, body dysmorphia. And as you can see from my little baby pictures here, you know, there was no need to trigger any sort of uh, eating disorder or, you know, hyper negative feelings about myself. I was completely healthy. I was on point, you know, doing my thing. But at um, 17 years old, this ballet teacher told me, I'd love to put you in the Chinese tea core of the Nutcracker, but the tutus are so short and your thighs are so big, it wouldn't be pretty. So that fall, I left for NYU Drama School and I started Weight Watchers. And it was well within um, uh, the old uh, MetLife scale, um, index of what you're supposed to be according to your height. But you know, there's no regulation with our diet industry and I started um, dieting, which led to an eating disorder by the time I was about 18 or 19. So I struggled with that during my time at NYU and as we all know, <laughs> School is not expensive here in New York City. So I have very vivid memories of sitting in, let's say, a Chekhov class or a Shakespeare class. And while my teacher is speaking, I'm thinking how many calories are in a hard-boiled egg. You know, how many uh, points I would gain if I worked out that night on a treadmill. You know, would I be able to have a light beer with my friends? It quickly consumed my mind, which also began, you know, a very dangerous cycle of external validation. And in Weight Watchers, you're, I don't know if they do it anymore, I haven't been in a while, <laughs> but you're weighed publicly, they weigh you in front of people. So very early on, I just associated with needing to be outside of myself, someone tell me that I'm okay, and fit within very strict parameters. So people often ask what, how I was able to stop the eating disorder. And I did counseling, very basic therapy. I even did a 12-step program. But the one thing that did it for me, I would say, is feminism and this book, which is called The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. And the essence of the book was that the further strides women take in other eras of our lives, the beauty myth, which is unattainable, will clamp down on us. So no matter what we do, something else will come up to make you feel like you don't have it diet industry, uh, fashion industry, makeup industry, all of those intentional or not, but it's working against you no matter how hard you're trying to fight it. So that was the essence of the book, but more importantly, I learned it wasn't my fault and I had internalized it for so long, I finally got angry and I felt like a pawn of the industry and I didn't wanna be a pawn. So I was able to break it and I thank uh, the powers of the universe every day that I was able to. So after graduation, I did the rounds in um, regular acting world, and I scored a big meeting with um, a big agency. I won't say their name, but they literally sat around a table and said to me, well, we love you, Elizabeth, but here's the deal. You're too fat to be the pretty girl and too pretty to be the fat girl. You can either gain 50 pounds or lose 50 pounds, but we can't work with you the way you are. And it was such... <laughs> Um, a watershed moment in my life. They said, what do you want to do? And I literally closed my eyes and I saw myself on that treadmill and I saw myself binging in the middle of the night and I saw myself speaking to myself in the most hateful language and I just knew, I said, I'm going to take door number three. I'm going to stay my, myself. And they said, well, we'll see you out there. Good luck. So it was around that time that a dear friend of mine suggested I be a plus size model. And I said, now Vinny, <laughs> what's a plus size model? Truly, no idea, because to me they were separate worlds. There was the acting world and there was the fashion world, and to me I had nothing to do with fashion. But you know what, it sounded right, it lined up with my principles, and I was determined to love myself as I am. So here I am at 24, my mother took this snapshot in my apartment, this is one of my first tests that I did um, with Stanley DeBoss, and it all kind of took off from there. So eventually I fell into the world of being a fit model, which is truly incredible. It's where you act as a live mannequin for the industry. So you're behind the scenes helping the TDs, the designers, the technical people who work so 
hard every day to make sure that these plus size garments um, fit the customers. What was so important about that was that I truly learned how arbitrary sizing is for fashion. Even today, I was at a fitting and the company was starting a plus line. They asked me what size I should call myself and how they should do their size chart. And it just shows you how truly, unfortunately, uninformed a lot of designers are when they go to start into a booming field and now plus is trending, you know, very much trending. So it was incredible that all those years I had hated myself in the dressing room, here I was being the live model for the clothes that women would try on in a dressing room, right? So at one point I lost some weight, I'd had the flu, well they started making the clothes tighter. And I immediately thought, well what about some woman in the Midwest who tries on this top? She's been buying a 1X for years and now she has to buy a 2X. So I literally went back in my head to my younger self and I apologized to her because how would she ever know that it wasn't her fault that the clothes didn't fit her? Uh, another mentor of mine also mentioned that men's clothes are tailored to fit their bodies and women tailor our bodies to fit the clothes. So I found that a really incredible um, point. So the fact that Plus is trending now, I just wanted to throw in the picture of Ashley, who I'm sure will trend through the evening. And that as incredible as it is that it's out there, we just, I want to avoid, I hope we avoid tokenism and really have more Plus women incorporated in all levels. So not just one model, multiple models, multiple ages, races, sizes, so the consumer doesn't realize that the industry is incorporating Plus, you know, which is excluded for so many years. So now that I was a fashionista, I loved it. I enjoyed being a fashionista. These are incredible women, Iris Apfel, Deanna Vreeland, and Lindell Cohen, who just passed away. And these are the women that I started to look up to because I used to be afraid to be looked at. And now I thought, what's, what's the point of life if I can't enjoy a simple thing like getting dressed in the morning? So I really started looking forward to being an eccentric, having people ask me about my clothes. And then I fell into the pinup world. The pinup world is incredible, I can't speak enough of it. It's also called the rockabilly scene. And oftentimes companies reproduce older patterns, but they um, grade them to larger sizes. So the bathing suit I'm wearing on the left is available from extra small to 4X. And on the right, that's from um, Forever 21. And that also encourages women to learn their measurements because they're ordering online, which is a lot of where the plus industry is right now. I've recently been working with Melissa McCarthy, who's an incredible actress and a true proponent of this industry. She herself has gone through it, having been um, a size 24, and uh, she's been losing weight, but is doing it in the most healthy and exciting way that she still understands a plus woman's needs and wants to be there for her. So that was also a seminal moment in my life where that I got to be on TV, you know, my ego was taken care of, but it was for something I cared about. You know, it wasn't a yogurt ad. You know, it wasn't um, something that I couldn't stand behind. And then the power of social media, which is all happening as we know, I started using Fat Kini. And at first I was embarrassed. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to say Fat Kini. I'm just going to do it. Well, this was picked up by MSNBC, Refinery29. And it's the idea that I will not lose the beach. You know, I will not lose the pool. I'm going to reclaim that for myself. So I'm incredibly interested in swimwear. And I may or may not have a bathing suit line that I'm working on in the future. And finally, here is um, my dress that I designed for pinup girl clothing. It's called the Elizabeth dress. And this is available in sizes extra small to 4X, and it's made domestically in the United States. And women all over the world are wearing this dress. And it's also given me a validation that I never thought I could find um, outside of myself. But it truly is people wearing what makes them feel good, not having to jump through hoops to find it, learning about themselves, and I may not have all the answers, but I am truly happier in my own skin. And I wish all designers and students to think going forward about their choices of models that they cast and their media. Today, I was working with a model in a, a lingerie showroom. She's a size six, and she's on the curve board of Wilhelmina. And she was telling me that she goes to castings and often gets yelled at by the client because they're so confused why the agent sent a size six. So it's everyone's responsibility to make changes in this industry, and I look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you. Hello, everybody. To go backward and forward. Sure. Okay, I'm just getting instructions here on uh, 
how to work the slides. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, I'm glad that Elizabeth set me up with um, a photograph of Diana Vreeland because that's where I want to start. Um, Diana Vreeland, the great style Diane, was once asked, do designers dictate hemlines? And she replied, only if you take dictation. And with that remark, she really exposed a big rift in the fashion world. There is a vast gap between fashion and style. Fashion is about clothes and about their relationship to the times and to the culture. And style is about you and your relationship to yourself. Fashion is in the clothes. Style is in you and me, the wearer. Now, I've always been interested in style. I've always considered it important. I've written about it many times over the years. And style goes way beyond fashion. It's an individually distinctive way of putting yourself together. So it's a unique blend of spirit and substance, personal identity, not all of it, of course, just a slice of it, uh, imposed on uh, and created through uh, the world of things. Now, it's a way of capturing something vibrant, making a statement about yourself in clothes, with clothes. As Anne Hollander said, it's consciousness made visible. It's inherently psychological. And it is what people really want when they aspire to be fashionable if they aren't just draping themselves in status symbols. So style, to me, is the perfect comeback in a culture that demeans everyone whose looks diverge from a very synthetic ideal. Style makes no judgment whatsoever about the body. Style always creates delight, and in doing so, it declares that you are perfect for you. Now, I've been writing and publishing articles about style and coming up with images of style um, and large size women for 31 years. That's before some of you were born, I'm sure. Um, so here's the important point. I have been publishing them in the mainstream, not segregated out, um, but in the mainstream media world. And I think that's very significant um, because not all women are a size two, and all women need to have positive reflections of themselves in the major channels of the culture um, as a reflection of their very right to exist. As long as, as the media mediate the culture, we all have to be seen in the media. So from March 1986, to March 1988, I published a series of special sections in Vogue magazine called Fashion Plus, whose banner statement was, style is not a size. My late husband and I partnered to produce these 32, 36 page uh, sections. They're little mini magazines, magazine within a magazine. He was the advertising director and publisher, and I was the editor and the style director. Um, I just want to say, for the pessimists in the crowd, I can assure you that very little has changed. I don't see the major fashion publications incorporating significant fashion coverage of women in much diversity, including size either editorially or advertorially. Now, for the optimists in the crowd, um, I do think some things have changed. First of all, we're having this meeting here. 
Um, and second of all, as media has expanded beyond print and more people have access not only to information uh, and discussion, but the tools of media production, there's a lot more activity in this area um, than ever before. Uh, the problem is that it's largely confined to niches and not given mass exposure, um, which is absolutely necessary and essential for shaping cultural perception. Um, and that's why I started Fashion Plus. I simply wanted to change public perception of this woman. I was that woman. In 1986, I wore a size 18, and I had a he healthy sense of self. Um, I liked to dress well, and I read the fashion magazines, and I still do. Um, and I was in the mainstream publishing industry, I still am, um, and at the time, I was executive editor of a hot young publication, American Health, um, it, that had started in 1981. And uh, after five years there, I was very ambitious and uh, sort of a hellraiser and doing all kinds of interesting things. But there was no place for me to move up. So I was kind of pushed out. Um, and. It didn't take long for me to figure out what to do. Um, I wanted to move toward a mainstream publication for women of all ages, age is important, and all body types. Um, I knew how to do it. That was important. I was in that industry. I knew how to do it. And so the idea was born uh, to create a classy vehicle showing positive images of larger women, and to do it in a leading publication that was essential, in the belly of the beast. Had to do it. So um, my partner and I had no problem getting meetings with the publishers of Harper's Bazaar and Vogue, and for a while it looked like both of them were going to sign on and do it. Then we'd have a problem. Um, but uh, Vogue stepped up um, and committed, and they wanted to take it on. And so uh, in the fall of, that was in the fall of 1985, long lead times in the publishing industry, so we were shooting for a March 1986 issue. The two big fashion issues of the year are March and September. Um, so. We've decided to go ahead with that. Vogue has decided to go ahead with that. And word got out in the business world and in the publishing world. Nonstop interviews, major stories in publication after publication, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, of course, women's wear, talk shows, television, Phil Donahue. I was thunderstruck by the reaction. And See, you have to understand, I'm a writer. I come from the world of ideas. This did not seem like a terribly revolutionary idea to me, um, that there was a diversity uh, among women, among people. Um, but apparently it did to the rest of the world. Uh, and they went berserk with this. Reporters on I won't name the publications, but major publications, household names, competed for the right to do the story in their publication. It was, it was sheer craziness. So we hoped like hell that the manufacturers and the stores entering this new upscale market um, for large size women, um, large size fashion, would really rally behind us. Now I have to say, that sometime in the early, mid-80s, a store called The Forgotten Woman, uh, Woman started, and that too was revolutionary. The idea that there should be um, fashionable, well-made uh, clothes for larger women. And so it was a phenom. It was happening. 
And on the heels of the Forgotten Woman opening, Bloomingdale's opened a department. Lane Bryant was there all along, not necessarily oriented to the higher fashion aspiration uh, that Bloomingdale's Forgotten Woman, Saks Fifth Avenue came in, Lord and Taylor came in. So there was this big moment happening. Um, so, uh, so we moved ahead um, talking to manufacturers and, and stores, and we went to talk to all of them. And it was a really tough sell. Um, Bloomingdale's was actually the first to sign on, and that's because they have a booming business, and they have for years known the value of publicity and promotion. Um, but everybody else was very, very tentative. Um, Fashion Plus was produced independently with its own editorial pages and advertising pages and bound into Vogue. Okay, so you get the March 1986 issue of Vogue in the mail and you're reading through it. There's no public announcement. Uh, there's nothing on the contents page. And you turn the page, and of course I have the wrong page here, but uh, um, you turn the page and this is what you see. Um, and I just wanna give you a run through of uh, some of the uh, images here. So this is the first opening page of our opening section in the March 1986 Vogue with no prior announcement. These are some of the images. Now I wish I could say that our first editorial uh, photographer was enthusiastic. Um, he was selected by the art director um, because we all felt that we needed a brand name photographer to make our point. I do it differently now. Um, we did have a brand name photographer and his credit line uh, in our section reads Franklin. That was not his name. Um, and I will say the image makers are part of why we all have this problem. Those people who design the images, who shoot the images, um, more so even than the people who publish the images. So let's see, this is a bit of a surprise to me. Okay, this is an advertisement from a designer whose clothes just started size two. So he makes clothes, I think he's still in business, and um, his, he makes no distinction and designs for women, all women. This is another advertisement. This was the last page of the first section. These are uh, editorial pages uh, from the section. Lane Bryant was there, um, advertisement in the section. This is the cover of the second section we did. So this would be, no, it must have been, no, it's spring. So it uh, must be spring, um, spring of 87. I can't quite remember um, which one it was. But, you know, if you took in the arms a little bit, that suit would be as fashionable uh, today as it was then. Bows are big. Um, and uh, this was the editorial that appeared in the, um, in the uh, second issue. Can you read it or can I tell you a little bit uh, about what it says? What I talk about is how um, 
the response. Now, you have to understand, since this was an advertorial, readers make no distinction. So tons of letters were sent to Vogue magazine. Those were not passed on to us. But many, many letters were sent directly to us. People read the, uh, the bottom and, and, and saw what our address was. And of the many letters, um, one came from a woman, a group of women, who had trekked to the wilderness of um, Canada, the northern wilderness. A group of them had gone on a hunting and fishing trip real women of the world, and um, one of them had taken her Vogue magazine with her to share with uh, all of her friends, and they were struck dumb when they opened Vogue and found this section. And she wrote me a letter uh, to tell me how excited they were to see representations um, of all women. It was their doctor, their neighbor, their best friend, um, and uh, that was just a sample of the excitement that greeted this publication, and it cut across all sizes. The, the letters didn't come from just one group of one size of women. It came from everyone. Okay, these are more images from the section. Um, this is an ad from The Forgotten Woman. Another editorial page. Another advertisement. Um, and so it went. Um, so we, we published through... Um, until Anna Winter took over uh, Vogue. We, at that point, we tried, but we couldn't get financing. We couldn't get, I should say, we couldn't get support for an independent publication. It takes a lot of uh, a rich advertising base. Um, so there just wasn't enough of an advertising base uh, available or willing, and certainly not willing to commit on a regular basis. And so it disappeared. and and. What disappeared was even the intermittent presence of a more diverse view of women in the mainstream fashion media. But of course, the idea has never gone away. Um, any observation of women will assure the most casual observer that there's far more diversity than seen on the pages of Vogue. Now, I always shake my head when, they're just, when there's a discussion afoot, usually every fall, um, uh, about the look of models um, uh, any given season. And they talk about this new diversity of models, by which they usually mean fuller lips or higher cheekbones, differences that no outside observer would ever recognize as a significant variation. Um, but the diversity of women is inescapable, and so as women continue the struggle to assert their value in the world, and hopefully we will have uh, a woman leading this country demonstrating the value of women in the world, uh, the idea never really dies to represent all of us visually. And every now and then some new effort pops up and then it sort of, seems to uh, go away, never gaining traction. And as for me, I rolled my interest into the book, Style is Not a Size, and shortly after that, um, I was asked to uh, edit a reborn psychology today, where I've been for the last 25 years, occasionally writing about style, because I think style is really important. I think younger women are much more empowered now, and I look forward to seeing how the representation of all women in fashion media evolves. But I have to tell you that I, it's, it's really a much bigger issue than fashion and fashion publications. At Psychology Today, it is a triumph when the art department casts a woman over 30 for a cover even for 
an article about aging once it happened. We live in a very mixed society. When do you see that represented on major covers? I'd like to see it. So I'm trying to fight. I'm trying to fight the good fight in psychology today. Um, but um, art directors need to be brought into this conversation. So thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? I don't think so. I'm too big. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to thank Hazel for having me sit along in this panel today. It's really amazing to be alongside all of these accomplished um, women. Um, I represent the boring academic of the group. Um, I represent the boring academic of the group, and I'm going to be asking the hard questions as we do. Um, but generally speaking, my research interests in plus-size fashion are quite broad. They span much of the 20th and 21st centuries, and they cross over from historical concerns to issues about the body, gender, and power. Uh, during my MA here at Parsons, I was more preoccupied with the latter, and my thesis project broadly addressed the intersections between fat shin blogging, fat stigma, and embodiment. More recently, I've pursued a more historical research trajectory, examining the origins of the modern plus-size industry in the 1980s, uh, what Hara did, um, and the great-grandmother of plus-size fashion, Stoutwear, at the turn of the century. The red thread that connects these very disparate historical moments, however, is the relationship between dress and the body, and in particular, this notion of figure flattery, uh, which I've been thinking a lot about lately. Figure flattery, as I define it, uh, and as it pertains to plus-size fashion in the body, is a normativizing or moralizing discourse espoused by the fashion industry, and which brings order to or contains or transforms unruly, fat, female flesh into something that's more discernible, aesthetically pleasing, um, or aesthetically pleasing within a society that deeply abhors fat, uh, something more feminine, so to speak. Said differently, it's the idea that fat women must dress in a manner that makes them appear taller, slimmer, and more hourglass-shaped, um, and most importantly, less fat. Uh, an appearance which panders to the male gaze or the normativizing gaze. It's a radical idea, but I've been wondering what does it even mean to look good, um, and where did this cultural construct come from? Uh, the discourse of figure flattery and large size dress has its origins in the early 20th century when Albert Malson, who was the husband to Lane Bryant, uh, applied the scientific principles of optical illusion, um, the same principles he argued that were used in Gothic architecture, um, to garments for so-called stout women to make their bodies appear more youthful and feminine. And you can see it in this rendering here. Uh, on the left, it's a poorly dressed woman, and on the right, it's a woman whose body is transformed through appro appropriate large size dress. Uh, I'm of course very interested in the longevity of the notion of figure flattery um, within an industry that's predicated on change, um, but perhaps the most recent instance uh, of this notion of figure flattery entering public discourse has come from Tim Gunn's recent Washington Post op-ed in which he upbraided the fashion industry for marginalizing the 67% of American women who wear a size 16 and above today. Ironically, and perhaps maddeningly, this is the average woman who is both the norm in our country, but who is also woefully neglected by fashion makers. While, Gun while Tim Gunn's big heart was definitely in the right place, I found his piece slightly tone deaf, however. Although many forms of fat stigma within the fashion industry are overt, such as Anna Wintour saying that fat people look like little houses, or Karl Lagerfeld bluntly stating that he hates fat people, uh, an implicit bias underpins even the most well-meaning gestures within fashion. This may include telling a woman who is plus size that she doesn't look fat, or euphemistically referring to a large woman as real. In Gunn's case, his particular ire stemmed from the fact that designers were failing to make clothes to make fat women look quote unquote fabulous, clothes that are done right, he said, and which can make us look taller and slimmer. And this is where we can pause for eye rolls. Um, but joking aside, it's true that the idea of figure flattery 
drives uh, the sartorial choices of even the most slender women. But for fat women, it's an idea that has formed the foundation of an entire industry, of an entire lifetime of learned dress practices. In the broadest sense, fat women in American society have been conditioned to believe that they take up too much space. Body parts such as fat upper arms, muffin tops, or the so-called visible belly outline have been rendered taboo by fashion. Moreover, the clothing made for them has on the one hand functioned to cover them up, to make them more inconspicuous, or on the other to make them look more feminine. Indeed, as anthrop anthropologist Mary Douglas has argued, it's the natural response to disorder uh, is systematic classification, and plus size dress as I see it is a normativizing medium. Moving beyond this idea of figure flattery, something I'm increasingly interested in, an issue I'd like to put on the table for discussion today perhaps, um, is how and if we can begin to conceive of plus size fashion design as a space for innovation itself. If designers can see beyond figure flattery in order to glimpse the potentialities of designing for bigger bodies. After all, it's fashion designers who set the agenda. Um, I guess I'm being slightly provocative, but what happens if we throw the idea of figure flattery out the window? What if we were to um, throw the idea of beauty out the window? Uh, what if rather than hiding or reshaping these taboo body parts, they were emphasized? What if the fat body was made bigger? Granted, I have absolutely no background in practice, so I'm not entirely sure what these clothes would look like, uh, but I think it's a conversation that's worth starting, particularly amongst design students. And I do think that there are already some interesting examples of this renegotiation between the fat body and dress happening. Um, for example, fat activists and fat chinistas have been taking the raw materials provided to them by the industry, breaking the rules and redefining dress practices. On the group Tumblr, Fuck Yeah VBO, which is subtitled uh, A Celebration of Not Hiding, the contributors engage in an all-out celebration of the visible belly outline, or that roll of flesh that sits at the pelvis in which for centuries women have been told to compress, cinch, or hide through their clothing. Moreover, these are women who, because of their bodies, have long been denied access to fashion. They've carved out their own space and have not just embraced their VBO, uh, but they've made, a they've made it a sartorial centerpiece. Um, similarly, Gabby Gregg, um, famous for her blog Gabby Fresh, uh, was tired of wearing conservative, body-hiding, one-piece swimsuits, uh, so she made the brazen choice to post an image of herself wearing a so-called fat kini onto her Instagram one day a decision that she's been able to leverage and into, into an entire line of uh, fat kinis for the brand Swimsuits for All. And then finally, uh, there's the Project Runway winner, Ashley Nell Tim Tipton, who was the first in the series history to design an entirely plus size collection, one which was rendered in a muddy pastel palette and which dared to translate crop tops in the shears trend for fat women. Granted, Tim Gunn tore her a proverbial new one, claiming he'd never seen such hideous clothes in his life and calling the collection condescending to fat women. But Tipton's fat followers, on the other hand, were overjoyed to see a designer so fearlessly and uncompromisingly translate fashion trends for them. Avant-garde designers like Martin Margiela, Ray Kawakubo, and Alexander McQueen with his famous bumsters uh, who began the low-rise denim trend in the 90s um, have experimented in rethinking the ideas of fit and figure flattery. Arguably, these are not beautiful clothes, but they're important clothes. Um, I think that we can all see how they rethink radically the relationship of the body to dress. Um, so my question is, what if we placed the fat body at the center of such radical experimentations? Fat activists, bloggers, and consumers um, in many ways have led the charge and the industry's move towards inclusiveness. Uh, but I think now that we've opened the doors, it's time to evolve this discussion in reconsidering the practices of plus size fashion design from the ground up. Uh, in an industry in which there's nothing new under the sun, I think that there's a real tangible opportunity for design innovation here. Thank you. Okay, so we're we're going to open it up to some questions. Um, I wanted to start by talking to our, the designers on our, our panel. Um, I would argue that you guys are, are sort of leading a, a charge in, in designing for women of all sizes, um, but there's many that are not. And I think, I'm not sure who mentioned the 67% of women fact, right? So we know the buying power is there. And I would love for you guys to talk to some of our design students here about hypothesize maybe about why certain designers are not or why most designers in fact are not 
and why we should start? <laughs> it's a big question, I know. <laughs> you, you know, the fashion industry, to a great extent, is about belonging to a clique, right? It's, it's, it's teenagers in high school, right? We're pretending that we're all new and we're pretending that we're all different, but who was it that said you're either in or you're out? Is that a thing? Somebody said that, right? Yeah. Project Heidi Runway, Kim. right? Yeah. And, and I think it's hard for people to take, a, to take a step outside the norm. It's hard for people to risk being ridiculed or being laughed at by, by not, or being diminished by, by booking conventions. It's also a risk to their business because it is such a convention. Yeah, so, so those who do take it on, I think are brave and are perhaps longer sighted because the fact is the market is growing considerably. Well, I just want to thank you guys for staying because I know this was supposed to end at seven and it's like seven now. So um, I'm glad that we're here and I know Elizabeth, you probably have to go. Do you want to say like, here you go. No, I, I just want to say this is, was amazing and the best thing for me was seeing that Vogue spread from the <laughs> 80s, you guys. Oh my God. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I would love to do this again, but I have to go do a lab and, and talk to some students. So Emmy is going to sit in for me. I, I, can we remember this moment, too? So I can't believe it. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Welcome, Elizabeth. Emmy. So if we're talking about why more designers are not designing for plus-size women, I do feel like the convention is people just kind of go with what they have to do. And uh, designing for multiple sizes when you're designing your initial sample set does require more work. Because if you just have your block pattern and you do one sort of size, you just kind of are replicating that block. And so you have your, your size and you know if it's this one person. And then to make it fit multiple people in your design process, you have to kind of go back to that pattern making, find new blocks for all different sizes. So I guess that creates a little bit more work in the process. It's just whether where are your priorities? Do you care to make multiple sizes or do you just want to go kind of with the base minimum, get it done and move on? And I feel like that's, I think, one barrier to people is, is the extra time added to the design process. But um, it's definitely worth it. Um, I'm going to say something that might antagonize some people. I'll take the risk. Um, and that is that the fashion industry, in many ways, is very conservative. Um, I, there's the illusion that it's always uh, on the cutting edge. And of course, you know, through that pun, it is on the cutting edge, but not the cutting edge um, uh, of the culture and cultural ideas um, in many ways. The fashion industry is not only is it conservative, it's very oriented to the concrete, to material goods. And so it is not as responsive to ideas moving through the culture. Um, and it takes a while for them to penetrate. I think, I'm just throwing this out as an idea, that maybe some of what needs to happen happens on social media where people take the risk. And yes, we know about social media. I could write the best thing in the world, put it on social media, and I'll have 2,000 people sending me death threats. So we know that social media exposes everybody, not just someone taking a risk. It, it, it exposes everybody to negative feedback. Um, but knowing that, or I think it's important, because of the very low barrier to entry in social media, I think it's really important for people to take images, post images, um, do little experiments with their friends and get them out there. And, and then some of them will rise to the attention 
of wider audiences, posted on Facebook, uh, in other media. I, I just throw it out as possibly a way to really get active uh, in this way and to bring about some of the change. I don't want to sit here for another 30 years and lament that the culture isn't further along than it was in 1986. Well, I have a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, please. I would actually love to hear it from you. <laughs> I just have a, a quick suggestion, and I think this forum at Parsons in New York City, um, one of the leaders in, in a great fashion education is to start here, is to start in the educational process, to teach grading, to teach inclusive fashion education, to start at freshman year and get the students integrated with a diverse range of forms, of illustration, whether it's the, the more angular illustration or a more curved illustration, but to show diversity and inclusivity from the get-go. And when you have designers graduating incredible institutions such as Parsons, and other wonderful universities, not only in New York City, but around the country and around the world, wondering what have we missed here? Why can't we get this right? And we don't want to see this be a trend. We want to see this have roots and get nuggets in there. Just be integrated into the rest of the world. That's Just one of the themes like that. here. That's you know, right. Oh, so okay. education is where it's at. And um, it's a really exciting time right now. Uh, I think that at first, if you integrate uh, and, and students don't really know that that's an, in, that's an option, I think there's a little bit of a revolt, like, I'm a designer. I don't design for fat women, which is really, that's changing because other schools are doing this. And it's now being welcomed. It's being embraced. And guess what? The designers get to graduate, and they make probably more money than other designers because they have an inclusive education. So <laughs> it's, a, it's time has come, and it's prime for the picking. It's the low-hanging fruit. That's how we stick and hang in there and make it a real business. So hi, my name is Linda Flowers, and I'm here from AARP and from Washington, DC. And I just want to... Um, echo what you said. So one of the things that we are doing in partnership with Parsons this year and next year is challenging students to uh, design some fashion for people with physical and functional limitations. And we believe that that is going to seed a whole other generation of uh, students and future designers who care about this community. Uh, we're asking them to interview people and tell a story with their design so we understand how they came to it and what it means to them and what it can mean to transform the lives of the people that wear those fashions. So I just wanted to make you aware of that competition. We will be judging it next year, I think, in um, February or March. And so we feel that seeding the educational process is a very important part of making this cultural change. I would love to talk to you about fashion without limits. Great. Yeah, but you. I'm a little concerned when you say um, designing uh, for this community. I really like Becca's inclusion without any fanfare and of I, a woman with a prosthetic leg. Um, I, I, we have to think of I it think as, as this is just us. This is just what people are. It's all of this. So I think that there's the opportunity to actually make these into universal designs. So for example, one of the Parsons students has designed a line for people with visual impairments. That's actually beautiful and something I would wear too. So we're not suggesting that you, know, you call out the person with the disability because they're wearing this frock. We're suggesting that we can make universal design that's accessible to a broader range of individuals. But I do see like an opportunity in, in designing with people with disabilities or different abilities there's so many cool new things yet to be created for all these different you know, avenues, whether it's prosthetics or garments that act as tools to regulate heat temperature or just so many different things in the design world that are popping off because we're being exposed to all these limitations on one side, but that's just breeding more creativity. So yeah, it's really an exciting place to be in the design world.
Yeah, and I like, particularly was interested in Lauren's suggestion, which I think is, on the one hand, very radical, but on the other hand, I think it's what needs to happen. How radical is it that if you think of the body, which comes normally in a variety of shapes and sizes, and you aren't thinking in terms of let's flatter it, but you think in terms of style, and you create something very interesting that works. As I said, st style and in really interesting fashion is not making a judgment on anyone, not on the size two and not on the size 22. It's not making a judgment about a body. It's just saying, wow, isn't this really interesting or isn't this creative or avant-garde or whatever, whatever it aspires to be. And it's eye-catching and it uh, uh, makes wear a feel uh, very good, and it creates a dialogue uh, with other people. So I think that's uh, a really important point. I it's would radical, love to, but not so radical. Yeah, I would love to talk about the activism a little bit, uh, because Lauren touched on it, but Elizabeth beautifully touched on it as well. And I would love to know your thoughts on, on what we need to make that activism go forward, right, and to make it bigger. We have students, students are the best activists, right? So let's tell them what needs to happen. Do we need bigger brands? to support this, what happens? Because it has to leave social media at a certain point to get bigger, right? If you have thoughts, I would love to hear yeah, them. Yeah, I think it has left social media. I think that the brands have co-opted it um, and it has entered the social discourse now. I think, you know, whenever I started my master's project in 2010, um, this notion of fashion blogging was really new and boundary pushing and, you know, there were fashion bloggers like Nicolette Mason and Gabby Fresh who wouldn't declare themselves fat women. Um, but now, you know, only six years later, it's entered, you know, mainstream discourse. I think it's there. Um, for me, I think the way to evolve the conversation, like I said, is to move past this idea of figure flattery and what a beautiful body is. I feel like the buzzword now is that all bodies are beautiful bodies. Um, but I don't know, I guess my provocative question is why don't we throw that idea out the window? Like, why don't we do things that are more interesting instead of pandering to normative ideas of Healthy beauty? is beautiful, healthy. Yeah, yeah, or like what Haro is saying, maybe it's a matter of style or something, but... Um, radical ideas. Radical ideas, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know, like for me, you know, high fashion designers, couture designers aren't creating things that are necessarily always flattering to the female body. They're doing interesting things, and I think it would be really interesting to see design students or high fashion designers approaching the fat body in that way too, like what Becca is doing with Chromat, you know, in a sense. You know, it was interesting when you were talking, what you were saying and what I was saying were parallel and opposite at the same time, which I thought was really interesting. It's about looking at beauty in a new way and, 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 and considering beauty from a new point of view. And I think there's room for both because you do have to push culture forward and you do have to change perceptions, but you also have to dress 67% of women who are a size 12, size 12 or above and dress them beautifully. Exactly. Yeah, not all women want to be pushing boundaries. Not all women want to be pushing boundaries. So I think the core idea about challenging beauty is important. And the different ways we can do it within the more commercial, intellectual, avant-garde arenas are different. Exactly. And just to return to this Tim Gunn example again, you know, he hated Ashley Null Tipton's collection, but her followers and, you know, large swaths of the fat activist community and fashionistas loved it. And honestly, what she did was not groundbreaking. She just made a crop top and a sheer skirt for a large woman. Um, but people want that, you know, not all plus size women want to, you know, like flatter the body. They want to like make statements as well. We have a question from the audience, which I'd love to take. And if anyone else has questions, please, microphone is here. Go ahead. I'd like to thank the panel and everybody that attended. Just so you know, some students had to go back to a class, so they weren't <laughs> abandoning you just before 7. I, I want to say that I'm, oh, by the way, I'm faculty here at Parsons, that as designers, we're artists approaching a canvas. And when you see the beauty in a woman, regardless of age, regardless of size, it's fascinating. 
And as designers, our job is to adorn that canvas, to decorate it, so to speak, with that perception. And one of the things that I think ties in with this, and I think we are at a very pivotal point where different body types are literally about to infuse and heavily influence that previously niche area of high fashion. And I think along with it, there's something that I'll go on record as calling obscene, is body modification to limit what you look like or to try to match an ideal. As everybody in any fashion or art business knows, if you're trying to create with what's happening now, you're too late. So to try and match your face to, and, and I apologize for anybody who happens to like it, but I think when somebody gets Botox, that might look good in the mirror when you're standing still. But when you go to speak, some of your essence is lost to that. And so if we start to modify ourselves to what we think is a good norm now, you may be stuck with that. And then later on, I mean, I just know people of every age and every style that are fascinatingly beautiful. And I think confidence, as was mentioned, when you've got a nice pair of jeans, it's not about your size, it's about what happens in your heart. And I wanna invite all students and working people in the industry, think about that. So what you're saying is a value Wait, but I'm pro-choice. I feel like anyone can choose what they do with their body, whether it's modification or not. I don't I'm know. Okay. I, I'm not like a, I, I. I get what you're saying about confidence being key, but anyone can do what they want, and it's not for us to police or decide. I'm not, I'm not talking about you know if you want to do earrings, piercings, that kind of thing. I'm talking about um, overworking something to try and fit in the norm. Just like if you're trying to modify your body to fit in the clothes. Obviously, you shouldn't put yourself in danger or hurt yourself. Yeah in any way, but I don't know, I'm like pro Kylie Jenner, like let people do what they want <laughs> with their face, with their body. Well, I, I just want to address the idea of um, sort of broadening the values. Uh, Lauren talked about it, I talked about it, and then the questioner brought it up, broadening the values um, around which designs are made. I'm sitting here on the stage and looking at the audience and diverse in age and everything else, and I'm thinking to myself, what a gorgeous audience. And so what is making you gorgeous is you are sitting there focused. You're, you're, you're sending your attention up here. That's a kind of a magnificent um, display of humanity. I'd like to see us incorporate more than just one way of looking in clothes, but look at all the values that you can display in clothes. We, we tend to uh, put the name of style on that, but I, I just think that there's more than just the value of slimness and flattery um, and uh, gorgeousness. There are just other ways. Go ahead. Hi, uh, first of all, I wanna say I am honored to be in all of your presence and your students' presence. I mean, I can't say enough about that. But my name is Leslie Flores, and I'm New York Fashion Week Model of the Year. I miss <laughs> Ultra, which means thank you. So there are steps out here, and the Fashion com uh, Committee took it upon themselves to make this new category, Miss Ultra, not Miss Plus, not Miss Short, not Miss Fit. I am plus size and fit. I'm size 12, I'm five foot six. I am a fit model and I'm a plus model. I rip the runway in nine inch heels and I do print. There are students, there are designers, there are uh, magazines, there are bloggers that are taking the initiative to put us in the forefront and include us in everything. I have three brand designers and I'm their brand model and I'm included in a motorcycle ad. I'm included in active wear. I do junior urban wear. I'm 47 years old. What I wanna to say to you is, are you all going to take the steps to remove the people that are being your barriers? 
because I know as a plus size model, as a freelance model, no agency, no manager, I beat the street when there's castings just like everybody else. But for your casting, for your magazine, for Lane Bryant, I was just told last week at this symposium, oh, we only do agency models. Why? I'm buying your stuff. My undergarments are Lane Bryant. I shop your store every month. So why can't I represent you? Why do I have to be part of an agency? Why are you letting the art director pick the models from the agency? Why aren't you doing an open casting call? Why are you letting the creative director for your photo shoot decide what the model should look like? If you're designing in your creation, us freelance models, we understand that because we're the ones that are doing it without pay. We're not looking for the $5,000 to hit the runway. Right. We're doing it just to get the recognition and exposure. We want and we know how to take your creation and make it alive. So, We're not longer a walking hanger. We don't do that anymore. I would actually love to, I mean, I think that there are barriers probably that will forever exist, unfortunately, but I would Why love don't to all of you band together? You're the magazine, you're Absolutely. the head fashioner, you're the designer, Let's you're the model, it. you're the psychiatrist, you're the writer. Band together. Absolutely. <laughs> And That's do what things, we're doing. and then give the student. But make it real. Yeah. We're sitting here in a room. Absolutely. Make it real. Don't make it hard. Have open casting calls. Provide the students with plus size mannequins. Come on. I will really? say Parsons does have plus size. Yeah, I would actually love. So Emmy broke barriers, broke boundaries. Right. So I would love to give her a moment to talk about how she fought some barriers and and kind of has made it to where she is in her career. Thank you, that's very sweet. Um, thank you. There are full-figured uh, uh, Wolf Form for one, and then there's another big, wonderful form uh, company that is our Ventura, what is the, the name? Alva Form. Alva Form, yeah, that's, it's like pliable, real body kind of thing. They are working and sending it out and pumping out to design schools pretty much this year more than ever before. Wolf Form has, um, is, it, they're doing it. Design schools are just getting it to really start teaching and to open the minds of the design students and of marketing and in uh, advertising and it, 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 in the educational process. You have to just keep on showing up. You must not give up. It's hard to show up when you don't know time and place to show up. You That's know what I why mean? Re agency and representation because it's the play to go, it's the, um, it's the, it's, there's a system in place, uh, and it just is the way it is. It, but why does it have to be the way it is? Look, I'm just saying look yeah. outside the box. I I've understand. gone to agencies, and I'm actually signed by a fit agency for fit modeling, but when I go to castings, and it's funny, I actually walked in 11 shows for New York Fashion Week that I got on my own, that I convinced the designer to make something my size. And like I said, I'm five foot six, but That's I also- amazing. But I also had three major shows that I was not allowed to walk in, even though I was the designer's uh, showcase piece because I was over a size six. And I won't say who those producers were produced by, but yes. So I, I'm gonna give her a, a spot to talk. I would love to continue this. We have to, we've already run over and we have a couple more questions. No, that's all I was okay. just going to say. But I would but like to continue this conversation because I think it's up. important at the reception. I'd like to hear from them. First off, I know I cannot top that. <laughs> <laughs> but I it's will It's not a competition. No, I know, I know, but like I, I can't go. But I want to say, what are your thoughts about Crystal Wren within the modeling ag agency or within the modeling world being a plus size girl who battled eating disorders but now is as small as a size four in today's world? today so in honor of crystal's journey mm -hmm. uh, from the hat I'm going to wear from the National Eating Disorders Association for over 20 years her journey is really her journey oh, of course. and we really cannot dissect she has given us uh, for a lot of people who might not know who crystal Wren is crystal wrote a book called hungry I believe it was monumental because she truly tore a part of her heart and put it on the printed page and really revealed how hard it was being a straight size model, going into full figured modeling, and she had wild success with that. And then her, she went through uh, going back to a natural set point from what she has said. We, you might miss her as a model, is that right? I miss her work. 
Yes, I know. Um, it's true, I understand. Her image as a full-figured ideal was truly something to be, you know, to be seen. Um, she is on her own personal journey, and I celebrate that. I'm sure everybody on the stage celebrates her being in all the various beautiful forms because her soul is still the same. Oh. This wonderful encasement that we have changes and ebbs and flows all the time, but she, she's, she is who she is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hopefully you get to, have you met her? No. Okay, so maybe one day you'll meet her and you'll tell her how you feel. That, I'm sure she'll be very happy about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay, a little bit taller. <laughs> Hi there. Nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Valentina Rodriguez. I'm a junior at Parsons. And right now, I'm actually working on an entire collection for curvier petite girls. I kind of feel like the redhead stepchild in that section. Um, as weird as it is, I'm 4 foot 10. I'm a size 8. I weigh 150 pounds. And I am an eating disorder survivor. Um, so here I am now just trying to kind of design for me. Um, I've noticed at Parsons I bring my own batting because I feel as if there's not enough plus size mannequins. So I actually make my mannequins bigger. I bring my own batting, I wrap them around and whatnot, add the sizes. I think that's a massive issue, but also growing up, um, I've also had a lot of issues in the media and with clothing and whatnot, and I'm not alone on this. How do you think that designers or what, what's, how can we fix this mindset that young girls have? Like, how does Are you getting out and getting a getting your work seen and shot on beautiful, full-figured petite women, um, magazines like Style Watch, uh, knowing that you are sending them product constantly, you being on top of your game, making sure that you hit every magazine editor, go in, send them something to, for them to remember who you are, because everyone in this room is fighting very hard to get what you are trying to get. And if you just continue to work at it, people are going to say, first of all, full-figured petite designer who has style and wants to be in the fashion industry, that's a rarity right now. So you've already got a, a, a leg up, right? Yeah. So just keep at it and just, uh, just if you want to be able to shift things, you have to be seen. You have to, you're, everyone needs to see your product. What mindset do you feel you want changed? You said the mindset among young girls. Well, personally, mine was always, oh, if I was 20 pounds thinner, I would look really nice in that. Um, I think that the whole entire mindset of body silhouette, like, oh, I won't look good in that, I'm too round, or my back fat will show, or whatnot. How can we it's help? repetition. Yeah. It is. It's repetition. All right, I just use this as, a, as I'm going to bring this up, and we all can relate. We listen to a song on the radio, and we go, oh, my gosh, I can't stand that song. <laughs> That's like a horrible. And then a month later, you're sitting in the car, you're driving along, you're going, dee, 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 dee. You're singing to the song. This is exactly what it's about and what's happening right now with all your work that you're doing here. When you see these beautiful images, on billboards, in ad campaigns, on the side of buses, on the side of subways, and it's over and over and over again. Guess what? People's, there's a shape-shifting event taking place on the cover. I love seeing Style Watch and seeing the diversity on a few of your covers, and in t interiors, love it, love seeing glamour. I, I, I wish there was all inclusive in it, inside one uh, book, but it's okay, we're, we're, I'm gonna not knock anything at this point because we need all that we can, but it's repetition. Yep. It is absolutely repetition, and that's when men, women, kids, kids, our kids today, when you start having children, you guys, your children are gonna come right into this world thinking, well, duh, de rigueur, we've got, the, of course we should have diversity because of all the work that's going on now. You know, I work for Lane Bryan, who is the, 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 the leading plus size retailer and we're fighting change inside and we're finding it every day we have one of my lovely designers who's a parsons graduate is here michelle we have on the wall the signs that says aoc we're agents of change and some days we want to kill ourselves because we're not changing enough <laughs> but we have to show up every day and know that this is what we're doing we're agents of change each person has the responsibility if that's what you feel really strongly Oops, sorry if that's, each person has a responsibility 
obviously to have a good day, you have to have a good attitude, as with the full-figured industry, to integrate, integrate, integrate inclusive fashion statements and not giving up. That's how you're gonna change that kid, that girl, that woman, from thinking that she has to be less than or more than, than instead of being in the present moment and honoring what she has to be able to gump, jump into that fabulous outfit that you have oh, and I mean having her change her day, you know? I made the shirt. <laughs> yeah, I, I like it a lot. It's really great. And good luck to you, Thank really. You. you ladies are absolute goddesses. Thank you for tonight. <laughs> Love Thank you. you. Bye. <laughs> All right, this is gonna be our last question. <laughs> Hi, okay. Hi, um, my name is Zoe. I'm a second year in fashion design. And I just wanted to give a response to the gentleman who uh, like discussed or brought up the topic about body modifications. And I think regarding to like, are you spe spe specifically discussing like lip injections and like botching and everything and like even the newer trends of corsetting and everything. I just wanted to respond to that. I think, especially in the industry, the people that make the decisions on what is beautiful or what is correct, we tend to think, oh, my perception, how I see it, is correct. Therefore, people who may have different perceptions of beauty is incorrect. It, because like, all across cultures, everybody has different perceptions of beauty. So usually, you know, when you grow up with these perceptions, it's like, this is how it is because this is what I know. Mm -hmm. So anybody where it's anything that's different, it, 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 it rubs me the wrong way because it's not what I'm familiar with. So like, while I understand that when we see, especially younger kids that are impressionable seeing these things and thinking, oh, I'm not correct, I wanna look like this. I think it's also, we need to remember that like, to that person who has, that thinks like, this is how I, this is like, this is who I truly am. Like I am someone that likes to get dolled up and everything. I'm someone who does think, I don't know, like I should like, I don't know, just someone that does kind of find a, that niche in doing those kind of body modifications as long as they believe that they're not hurting themselves and hurting everyone else, why are they not allowed to embrace that for themselves? Because even like other kinds of body modifications like piercings and whatever, because I'm someone that likes piercings and whatever, to other people, they don't, they think it's strange. Even if I'm trying to get a job and it's like that's not professional, but to me, I find, I identify with this. So I think it's important, especially in the industry, to remember that there is no wrong or right way to like identify, express to express yourself. And it's important to keep that in mind. That's what kind of breaks boundaries in fashion when you allow people to express themselves in that. It may see, even if like, even if it, it is, has some kind of negative t like injections and everything, there can be a dark side to it. It's also important to teach people, like, don't do it negatively. There's a positive way to identify with this if you think that this is, if you believe that this is what you are. You know, that's a part of like letting people do what they want to do, because it's like. I'm not saying never, I'm just saying that I want you as a person to understand that you're beautiful. If you choose to make a modification, you can. Mm -hmm. But trying to strive for an ideal like straightening your hair because straight hair is in fashion mm -hmm. or curling it because that's the thing or injecting your lips before you've had a chance to do, or judging yourself because the magazines are showing size ones if you're a size six or 12 or 14 or 20 i want you to be able to feel good about yourself that's so i but think even i think that. it's one of the themes here that let's minimize the judgment right and uh, provide more options. Right. And with that, I want to really thank Parsons because I think that is really where the forward movement is happening. This conversation didn't happen 30 years ago. This is happening now. And I think it belongs here. It starts in the design school. Um, it starts, um, 
that's one very good place to start. There are lots of other things that need to be, to be changed, but starting in the design school, I think is just fabulous. And I want to thank Hazel yeah. and everyone else who played a role in uh, uh, creating uh, this panel discussion. So we're gonna, we have to wrap up. We're gonna do the reception, but it, let's continue the conversation at the reception and, and that way we can all talk and, and all continue. Thank you so much, everyone.